Hello. So today we're going to look at stuff again, the stuff that Bridges is made out of. And so we looked at steel on Monday and yesterday we looked at a uh, thing explainer about Bridges. And so today we're going to look at some more stuff. So I'm taking some of my stuff from this lecture uh, and the one on steel from a book called Stuff Matters. It's a really cool book uh, about material science, but it's written with a lot of history, a lot of fun, a lot of interesting topics. So if you're bored, which I hear from many of you, it's a good read. Uh, so uh, let's start. I'm going to start with some unsung heroes of the biological world. So some critters and things that never get the credit they deserve. So if you don't recognize this, this is the dung beetle. Dung is another word for poop. And so the dung beetle are beetles that uh, here's them rolling some poop into a ball and then they use this. Um, and a lot of people are familiar with some of the most uh, like famous dung beetles that make these very nice looking balls. Uh, but there are over 7,000 type of dung beetles in the world. And think about it, every animal on earth poops. So where does all that poop go? And there's a lot of answers to that, but one of it is dung beetles are like the sewer system of the earth. So we need to give an applause to dung beetles. We also have our beautiful vultures. So vultures are kind of like the trash men of the earth because they are scavengers. And, you know, uh, when something small dies, then things like decomposers might be able to take care of it. Things like slugs and roly polies. But big animals dead, uh, then we don't want them laying around rotting and stinking. And vultures are the ones that help do that job of getting rid of um, by being scavengers. And if you've ever wondered why they're so ugly, like why do they normally have a bare head? It's because they stick their head inside of rotting flesh and they don't, uh, this is a way to keep getting parasites and other things in their feathers on their head. So they not, might not be the prettiest bird, but very important birds. And then last, we have the slug, the banana slug. So this was my mascot at UC Santa Cruz. And some people didn't like the mascot. I played uh, varsity basketball for UC Santa Cruz. And so, you know, we go to our competitions and the big slug mascot would come and by which year go slugs. And some people didn't like that. So they were trying to switch the mascot to a uh, sea lion. But I really liked being called a slug. Uh, it's a very unusual. Slugs are decomposers. So there's so many of them uh, and they go around around and help to, you know, keep our, keep the, keep the forest clean in a way. So now I don't really like them in my garden, but I don't have the heart to kill them. I don't have banana slugs here, but I have regular big old black slugs. So I go out and pick them by hand and put them in a bucket because I can't stand to kill something. So I put them all in a bucket and then I take them deep into the forest behind me and I release them. I call it my catch and release slug program. My kids think I'm crazy, but uh, it does help because they eat my little flowers as they're coming up in the spring. So those are some unsung heroes. So today we're going to look at some uh, unsung heroes in the engineering world. And we're going to take a look at concrete. Uh, so you might not think concrete is very interesting because, I mean, it just sits around being big and heavy, but it actually is got some fascinating science behind it. And it's also the number one building uh, material in the world by engineers. Uh, so here's a picture of a bridge down by Spencer Island again, a place where me and Zeus walk a lot. And this unit has just made me very aware of everything I see. So I really enjoyed teaching it. So this is a bridge we go under all the time, but I stopped and looked at it's this bridge is 100% concrete. There's no truss on the top. There's no anything else. We've got these huge concrete columns and then the bridge itself is made of concrete. There are some steel, uh, you know, triangles here also. Um, but think about the amount of weight on that bridge. Uh, so here we are. This is a movie. Uh, make sure I've got the volume down. I'm going to play it without volume and tell you about it. Uh, having a little technical problem tonight. So we went down to the river here. Uh, there's Zeus uh, going on a walk with me. And you can see that this concrete goes right into the river. This is a standard way that bridges are made. And so you, you might, again, science is all about asking questions. Think about, well, if it's in the river, how did that concrete ever dry? If you've ever got to play with concrete, you usually mix it up with water and you pour it and it 
dries is what people talk about. So how does it dry in the river? So we'll talk about that a little bit today. So there's those huge concrete pillars in uh, the river that we went to go walking at. Um, so I've had trouble with my movies. I'm gonna have to escape for a minute and go to the next one. Uh, as many of you have talked about, I think like the internet's broke some time. It just won't load or do things because so many people in our world are um, using it, but it's okay, we can figure it out. Uh, so this is the Grand Avenue Park Bridge, which is also in Everett. It's just gonna be a pedestrian bridge um, connecting Grand Avenue Park to the marina here, but it's gonna be a very cool bridge, I think, once it's developed. It is not finished yet. Here's just one end of it. So this is called an abutment. It's the huge uh, concrete, like, stable area at the end of the bridge holding up the bridge from side to side. So most abutments of bridges, if you watch, are made of concrete. Uh, so a common question is people ask is how long does it take concrete to dry out? But that very question means you don't really understand how concrete works because it doesn't really dry. It's not like when you fill, if you filled up those squares with mud and then in a couple days, the mud would be dry from evaporation. That is not at all what happens when you pour concrete. So uh, concrete is made of a couple things, a few things. Is some of it is air. It is porous. It has air in it. 7 to 15 percent of it is what we call cement. So the cement part is what you buy in the bags like at low and it's a very fine powder. And then you add water to that powder and you have to add some kind of aggregate. So an aggregate means uh, like sand or rocks, even pieces of glass could be an aggregate. So uh, Unfortunately, I hate to talk about it because we don't get to do labs, but I did a fantastic lab with my students where they tried to make the strongest concrete pucks by adding whatever aggregates they wanted. And I won't tell you the results right now. It's going to be a little game later, but they added everything from Easter grass to human hair to nails to tacks to um, paper to sponges to screens. It was a very interesting. And then we dropped heavy weights on them to see which one actually uh, survived the best. So the actual chemical comp the makeup of cement is calcium, iron, silica, alumina, and sulfate. These are all things we get from rocks. We break down rock to make cement. So the way it actually works is when you add the water to the cement and the aggregate uh, and mix it up, a chemical reaction starts. If you were to take the temperature of that wet uh, concrete, the temperature gets very hot, enough that it can burn you if you stayed in contact with it for a, an extended period of time. So as the chemical reaction goes on, the water isn't drying up, the water is becoming part of the new chemical compound, which is known as hydration. So it becomes a hydrate and it forms, these blue things are showing you, uh, this is just a visualization, but it's showing you uh, crystals. So crystals start to form all around the aggregates and what's cool is they form in a completely random, crazy pattern, all intertwined, which makes it really strong because there's no weak point. There's not a pattern to it. And so these crystals uh, are formed into the hydrate and the water doesn't dry up. It becomes part of the compound itself. Uh, so rocks are a uh, type of silicate usually, and they are incredibly stable chemical compounds. That's why most rocks are millions of years old and they last a very long time. There's not much that interacts with them. Um, so in order to make the cement part, the powder part, they have to get their raw ingredients and put it through a kiln. And a kiln is like a super hot oven. And what they do is they pour in the crushed rock here here, when it's crushed, it has more surface area, and they reach degree, degree, temperatures of 1,450 degrees, or that's over 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And what this does is actually begins to break the rock apart. Now think about it, those temperatures would never be found on Earth, and that's why rocks don't just fall apart on Earth either. Uh, so these new rocks get start to fall apart, and they form a new group called this calcium silicates.
here's kind of an overview of everything that happens from the beginning where they mine the materials needed for making cement and then everything that happens as they grind it from uh, the limestone to the rough ground limestone, fine ground limestone, the clay that they add in, the sand, and then here's the kiln part we were just uh, discussing. Now this part does uh, uh, put off some carbon dioxide in the air, so it's not a completely clean process, but it's a pretty cheap process. So concrete and cement are the cheapest building materials we have. Um, so there is this test that engineers do called a slump test. So just like a recipe for something like a cake or cookies, you can't just randomly throw in different amounts and expect them to come out correctly. With the cement, it is a chemical reaction. So ratios are very important. And if you have the wrong ratio, like if you have too much water, then uh, it, it does not work. It's not cohesive and it can create a weak concrete. If you don't have enough water, then it again creates a weak concrete. And so there's something called a slump test that they test the concrete as builders use it because buildings and bridges and things made out of concrete that was not made correctly can be incredibly dangerous. So here's a picture of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. So it was a massive earthquake uh, and a lot of the devastation caused is thought to be because many of the buildings were not made out of high grade concrete. People do like to cut corners, save money by, for example, using more water since water is generally free. But uh, while the concrete may look okay, it will not hold up to many types of stresses. So here's another picture of the earthquake in Haiti. That earthquake brought down over 250,000 buildings, causing them to collapse and killing more than 300,000 people. Uh, and they think a lot of this was due to shoddy concrete, but Haiti is not the only country that has shoddy concrete. Uh, it's actually all over you and, and you can't tell by just looking at it. And so that is one of the dangers if it's not made correctly. So concrete and brick are very different. Brick is, you know, you, you form the bricks in, a, I guess, a similar type of manner, but the brick themselves are the structure, the building block. block. Uh, but in cement, you actually pour it. It's like a liquid. And what this means, it's almost like a gel. It's not a liquid like water, but it's like a gel. And what this means is you can make any shape you want out of it because you can pour it into molds and then it hardens and you take the mold away and you have your shape. So it's a very versatile building material for that reason. And here's an interesting building. This is the Pantheon in Rome, and it's over 2,000 years old, and it's still standing. Now, after 2,000 years, uh, you would think that that concrete probably has cracks and stuff in it, and it actually does. It does have a lot of cracks in it. But because of its shape, like we learned about the arch, so this is a dome, a similar shape, all the forces on this concrete are still compression forces. So the cracks don't really weaken it because remember compression, it's being pushed together. And so a crack in there doesn't really matter much because the forces are still pushing it together. This is the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world today. Um, so here's those cracks I was talking about. So if the only thing, the only forces acting on it are compression, cracks aren't real dangerous, but um, concrete is only good at compression strength, so being squished together. So we have machines to test how strong it is today. There's some really cool YouTube videos out there about that. But the Romans were unable to solve the problem that it was terrible at being stretched. So you might think, well, what do you mean by stretching concrete? Well, if you were to make a ceiling or even a floor out of concrete, uh, then the middle of it will start to sag. If you were to make a bridge out of concrete, the middle of it will sag. That's those tension forces that would stretch the concrete and the concrete would begin to crack and those cracks would pull it apart and lead to devastation. So concrete is terrible about being stretched. So it uh, only had limited use in that Roman time. So it's very strong with those compression forces and very weak in the tension forces. So here's another bridge in Everett. Uh, this is just a pedestrian bridge, but I just want to point out the concrete here and how far it goes from one edge to the other. And why isn't it sagging here in the middle? Look at the amount of space. And, you know, there's there's no uh, 
steel reinforcements here. And you might think, well, it's only people going across, but think just how heavy the bridge itself is. So here we are on that pedestrian bridge looking at some of the concrete. Uh, let's see if this video works. Like I said, having a little trouble with it making my videos download today. So we were just walking across the bridge and wanted to kind of show you the whole span of it. And then also um, just sort of talking about why isn't it sagging between those points and how can this be 100% concrete and not fall apart? Um, so that's one of the questions we can answer here. Uh, here's a picture of it from the side. You can just see the massive amounts, all of it made of concrete. Um, so this guy is the one who first figured out a way to help concrete withstand those tensional forces. And I kind of love it because he was a gardener. He just wanted to make a pots that did not crack uh, under the force of the plants, roots, and uh, growing inside. So that would be causing tension forces, kind of stretching the concrete around the outside. And so what he did is he put wire mesh inside his pots first, then he poured his concrete. And this embedded mesh is what made the, the um, what made the pots not crack so it actually worked now he had no idea the chemistry behind it but basically his discovery led to the birth of what we call reinforced concrete so that picture we saw of the bridge that was all concrete inside that concrete is steel the steel is like the skeleton and then they pour the concrete over the steel and they found out they made perfect partners for each other that the steel and the concrete didn't remain separate the concrete actually grows onto the steel with all those crystals and chemical changes i told you about and then it also uh, things expand when they get hot and contract when they get cold and steel and concrete expand and contract at about exactly the same temperatures and rates. So they are just perfect partners. So what this did, this, this invention of reinforced concrete, these steel poles, they're taking all the tensional stresses at, on the steel and the concrete is the one supporting all the compressional stresses. And what it did is allowed us to make all sorts of structures now. When you look at high rises, they have concrete uh, on them, you know, going up many, many floors. Uh, here's a bridge that the pillars are concrete, but then the bridge itself is also made of concrete, reinforced concrete. This is the Hoover Dam. It is made of reinforced concrete, so it means it has a skeleton of steel inside. Uh, many of you put this as one of the prettiest bridges when you made your own PowerPoints. This is in France, and it's made of reinforced concrete. So it also uses some cables, but the bridge itself is made of concrete with that steel structure inside. Now, reinforced concrete can still, it's very cheap and very sturdy, but it does crack over time. So about every 50 years or so, concrete does need to be maintained. That may seem like a very long time, but when you think about most buildings, roads, bridges, etc., they've been around for more than 50 years. And what happens is these cracks let water in that then go and rust the steel on the inside. And once you break and rust the skeleton, once metals rust, it's no longer strong. And so the skeleton is broken of the reinforced concrete and the concrete won't hold either because it cannot hold up to those tensional forces. Uh, so that's one of the big problems. But now engineers are beginning to use what's called self-healing concrete. I think it's really fascinating. It's going to be one of the things you're going to do a little bit of research on. It's concrete that can fix itself if it gets a crack. Uh, another thing about concrete, it is one of the cheapest building materials, but it's also considered to be ugly and aesthetically unappealing. So it's not used for a lot of different types of projects or when it is used, it is covered up. And one of the reasons is it gets this dirty look to it with any time at all to the open air. But there's also, here's this church in Rome that was made out of a self-cleaning concrete that they discovered. So the concrete actually uses the sunlight to clean itself, which is another really cool thing that you are going to be doing a little bit of research on your own. I'm wondering through all this if perhaps they can come up with a self-cleaning dog, just put some bugs on him or something and make it get him all clean. I don't know, but there's Zeus needing a bath.
Uh, so your assignment is going to be to answer the questions about the video. They are mostly very short answers. And then I want you to do two research. How does self-healing concrete work? So science is all about hopefully questions coming to mind. And to me, it's a fascinating question. So I hope you're interested and you find out how is it going to heal itself. And then how does self-cleaning concrete work? Again, uh, scientific question. Uh, it's possible for it to keep itself clean no matter what the weather. So how does it do that? So I hope you learned something about concrete today.